Well, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about co-pilot. I'll try to make it as lively as possible. Usually, the audience after lunch is a bit tricky. I know I tend to doze off during that time, but that's all good. Copilot is Copilot Studio specifically is actually a, an exciting topic to really talk about. So, starting with some stats, uh, just to let you know about the importance of using something like Copilot. Um, most of those are as from Gartner, and according to them. 30% of the activities uh, that involve technology are going to be conversational uh, by 2026, which is quite an interesting percentage. So one of the things I really like about events like that is that you go and talk to people, you check what they're doing, you do some networking and so on. Um, and a lot of you have been telling me that they are actually using Copilot to improve their productivity on a day-to-day -day basis. And this Co this Copilot Studio session is about how you can bring that to the users and then focus the attention to what they actually care about and what they can work. So once you start that conversational uh, capability, then that will equate to reduction in cost. And it is estimated by that by 2026, um, the cost and labor will be reduced by $80 billion just by using conversational AI and technologies like Copilot Studio ChatGPT and so on. So that's quite an interesting stance. And that by 2026, 80% of any digital inter interaction will happen through a virtual agent. So that's also quite an interesting fact. And as I was uh, mentioning earlier in the keynote, that a lot of it has to do with a customer expectation. Once you get used to that capability, then you expect to see it everywhere. And then the demand for that technology will increase over time. Um, it, it's something as simple as having that mobile experience, right? So if you look at it 10 years ago, before the, the first iPhone came out, we used to have those little monochrome phones and, you know, just uh, the keypad where you can go and text and all of that. And then the iPhone came out and that revolutionized the whole mobile industry. And then you would now you expect to have a mobile first experience, whatever you're doing. In fact, uh, Department of Internal Affairs, which is uh, uh, the project that I'm working on right now, have that vision that even when you're applying for a passport or a citizenship, you need to have a mobile first experience so that people can actually use a mobile device, a tablet to submit their applications. And a lot of that has to do with stats as well. So you look at what phone factors people are using to submit their applications. They're not using desktops anymore. Some of them are using laptops, but a lot of them are using mobile devices and, and tablets. So it's all about that expectation that this needs to be there. And I'll tell you a little bit later about my experience with uh, you know, flying to Canada. Um, so I showed you the wheel this morning about all the different technologies that Microsoft is empowering with uh, Copilot. Um, so again, we're going to be focusing more on the power platform side of things and dynamic PC and And this session specifically is about that product right here, which is Copilot Studio. Um, so in the morning, uh, Mark was showing us some Power BI and Power Apps capabilities. Um, AK was doing the customer service uh, section in there. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I'll cover Copilot Studio. Eliza is going to do uh, tips for Copilot Studio after that. And then later in the afternoon, Mohan is going to cover Power Automate and Power Apps as well. So we'll give you a good overall view of um, all those things that are happening. Now, Microsoft is positioned um, very nicely in the market in terms of uh, a leader in the AI capabilities. And this is the magic quadrant provided by Gartner, where you can see Microsoft is by far the one with the most complete vision on what AI could be doing and how they can be using it. But they're lagging behind in terms of delivery capabilities compared to the AWS. So when Charles Lamana says that they're investing heavily in this area, Next year, I put my money on it that Microsoft will be in the leader all the way at the top. So watch that space and we'll see what, what's going to happen. Um, probably news from Ignite, so not necessarily uh, new news, uh, but our virtual agent, PVA, has been renamed to Copilot Studio. That's part of it. That's part of the story, right? So um, they've rebranded and they've got new icons. They've got a uh, new name for it. And the capabilities have increased significantly. So that's the same as the rebranding that we saw between um, what was called Power Apps Portals and now it's called Power Pages. So even though it's a rebrand, but it's almost like a rebirth where the rebrand comes with 
a breath of new technologies that have been introduced with Power Pages. And with Copilot Studio, it's the same compared to Power Visual Agent. So I'm not going to focus too much on the traditional PVA, where you would have a uh, some sort of a prompt conversation where you have to spoon feed it, uh, what information is being asked, how to retrieve the information, and how to respond back, which is, again, more traditional. If you're doing um, you know, development in a, in a company where you want the answer to be exact and you need to make sure that the security controls are applied as well. So, for example, I'm a, a customer from the public checking on my application progress. You don't want to get someone else's application returned in there. That's a, a privacy breach. Um, so in that case, you would follow probably a more traditional conventional way of actually uh, developing it. What I'm going to focus more on is how can you quickly uh, get your Power Virtual Agent or your Copilot Studio to actually understand information that is available out there and to service that information to whoever is actually making those calls. Aka.ms slash Copilot Studio. And there's another link that I believe is Try Copilot Studio if you're interested in, in giving it a, a, a spin. The links are at the end of the presentation. So if you want to do it at your own time, you'll be able to have a look at that. All right. So um, what can we do with Copilot Studio? We can build our own Copilot, um, and, and that's the crux of it. So we're not using something that is existing. Uh, we're not uh, necessarily using it for, from a maker perspective, but we're using it from a we're building a Copilot, and then we're giving that to a user to actually leverage. Um, and it's it's actually quite a, a powerful capability because you can extend it so if it does it can do it uh, because of alimentation and so on you can use one of the uh, 1100 connectors to actually go and fetch that information from somewhere else be it from a microsoft ecosystem or from uh, somewhere else as well you can imagine a lot of capabilities the way you talk to it but you can either use copilot to build your copilot i'm probably not going to talk too much about that but yeah that's where like you can use the maker experience to build another maker experience but right, so at a very high level, uh, let's talk about um, some of the capabilities that will be uh, that Copilot does provide. Starting from, um, you know, chatting over a, an existing knowledge or uh, a capability that is uh, quite, quite straightforward. So you would give it the intent that you would be expecting. So in here we have a decision tree. So basically you would be expecting someone to ask something that follows a specific uh, um, a description and then out of that you would go and make a decision that they're asking about x or they're asking about y and then you would enhance that by fetching additional information somewhere else and then so on. Um, so this is chat over knowledge um, then the next bit that i want to talk about is where you have uh, specific topics that you're talking about and this is where we can start enhancing it by either connecting to Power Automate, connecting to like get, getting some information from websites or getting information from PDF files. Um, again, I'll be demonstrating all of those capabilities in the demo. Uh, moving on, action and plugins. This is where it, it gets quite interesting. So you could have a custom API that you've built, um, something that it exists outside of your organization and you want to uh, surface that information back. So you would build that API and, and this is probably the bit that got me most excited about that, that talk today, is that you just give it an API and we'll figure out what that API is doing. And you would say, give me information. And it says, I can't because I need additional information. And you give it that additional information and it plugs everything together and it gives you a response back. So absolutely a powerful thing to have. Uh, but also the interesting thing is that if you have multiple APIs, um, that are somehow interconnected. You can link them. You can do them as a chain. So you'd say, give me a list of books, and it gives you a list of books. And you would say, you know, check out the first book, and it would know what the first book is and what the idea of that first book is, and then go and check it out for you. Each one of those would be a separate API, yet it would know how to link them together. And then we'll demonstrate that in the demo. Cool. And then once you've got that, then you've got that chatbot that is ready, but where do you want to put it? Then you can publish it into different channels. And there's quite a range of different channels that you've got at the moment. So starting with you know, your usual Microsoft Copilot, your Teams, but also building it into embedding it into your website, if you have one, uh, doing a sample website as well. But even as, as I said, if you don't like the Microsoft ecosystem, you can go beyond that. 
rather than use Teams, you can use Slack, for example, rather than use, um, you know, your SharePoint, you can use Facebook. And you can go to, you know, rather than use WhatsApp, you can go use GroupMe, which is quite popular in the US. So you can go beyond the Microsoft ecosystem and embed those technologies in there. And just to show you that they do work everywhere. Now that you've built it, now that you've published it, now that people are starting to use it, you need to monitor um, that capability. And as we were talking about earlier, sometimes it can give you the wrong answer. And in a way that is expected. So that's why thorough testing is very important. And having that uh, feedback loop is, is very important to enhance the capabilities of your uh, of, of your chatbot, of your uh, Copilot Studio. So as I mentioned, uh, this I was talking to a few uh, few few guys. <laughs> this month, this upcoming month is probably the most stressful in my life. Um, I've got this conference that I'm doing today. Um, next week on Wednesday, I'm uh, going down to Christchurch presenting at the Digital Workspace Conference, and then after that, I'm flying to Vancouver. Um, over there, uh, or Seattle specifically, so I'll go to Vancouver first and then I'll travel to, to Seattle. Um, we've got the MVP Summit that is happening in there, and right after the MVP Summit, uh, we've got the Canadian Bar Platform Summit uh, back in Vancouver. So I'll go Vancouver, Seattle, back to Vancouver, and then back to New Zealand. So four conferences, four events that I'm, I'm presenting at. And during all of that, I'm doing the biggest go live of my life. So we're going live with the Department on my face so you know when when my uh, you know myself is talking to myself and i'm like imagining what's going to happen I'm like i'm effed for the next month i don't know how i'm going to survive that um, but with all of that stress like you know you, you have to get on top of it and then you have to go and, and book things and so on so i was booking my flights and i'm going to travel with air canada and then once I am in Vancouver, then I'm going to take the Amtrak train from Vancouver down to Seattle. Um, and I was just making sure that everything is going to work in terms of luggage allowance, in terms of you know what I can take with me and so on. Um, and how much is it going to cost if I need extra luggage? Because you know I haven't been to the US for a few years. And when I go there, I go to outlet malls and buy as much as I can and then bring it back. And I just want to make sure it's worth it. And I was doing the preparation for that demo. I came across the Air Canada um, uh, event that you were mentioning earlier. So basically, the story goes that um, a guy is on uh, bereavement because his uh, mother passed away, and he wanted to know what the policy is in terms of refunds if you need to book an emergency uh, travel um, and then go within Vancouver from one state to the other. Uh, and then how much is it going to cost and whether there is a refund. So they'll give you a partial refund because you know, of your circumstances. You had to book the last minute, but you booked full price, whereas they can give you a discount for that and all of that. Now, the chatbot said, yes, no problem. You can get your refund. You can get up to 50% off your fare um, you know, after you book it. But what it didn't mention is that you have to come up with that agreement before you purchase your tickets and before you actually travel. So. Armed with this information coming from the chat bot, the chap actually took pictures, screenshots of everything that was said because now he had legal evidence that the chat bot told him that he is uh, eligible for a refund. He booked his tickets, traveled, you know, when you're stressed, you know, someone dear to you passed away, then you're not going to think about questioning what the chat bot is saying. And then eventually when they came back, they claimed that refund and it got refused. So I think they paid a, a total of uh, 1200 Canadian dollars and they were eligible for a $600 discount, which they never got. So they actually took it to court and then they went against Air Canada and they're like, hey, your chatbot said this and here's the screenshot evidence. And in fact, if you try it now, you're going to get the same answer. And then you guys are saying that that's that that's not possible. And Air Canada tried to argue that the chatbot is a separate legal entity and they're not responsible for everything that it's saying, which the court did not accept. So they had to pay that back. I mean, for $600, I personally would pay it so that I don't have all of that publicity and so on. But it was an interesting use case to understand that, hey, chatbots can get it wrong and that you can get an illegal uh, problem further down the track. And um, there are other scenarios where things have gone to an extreme. Um, I think there was an example where uh, from from the exe that I talked about in the past, where someone was using the public chat GPT to go and fix their presentation um, uh, uh, content, and they fed that information to the public chat GPT, which meant that now it became public information. 
So the competition was actually asking ChatGPT about how to solve a problem, and they came up with a DXC answer. They put it there, and we lost the bet. Now, that's again, it's whether it's a myth, whether it's reality, I don't know, but it's happened in the US, and that's why they're like, no more ChatGPT until we figure it out. I'm like, okay, oh, okay. Um, there's another example in the legal industry as well, uh, where people, uh, because uh, in, in some countries, uh, the legal uh, um, profession is all built on precedence. So if something has happened in the past, then you can go and uh, uh, quote it in, in court. You can say, based on precedence, this is what happened and so on. So they asked ChatGPT to retrieve this information and do the research for them. ChatGPT did that, but what they didn't realize is that that was a fictional case. So that case never happened. And when they went in front of the judge and presented their findings, the judge mocked them and it was a ChatGPT problem. So it's important to understand the limitations of what it can do and like uh, how it can get it wrong. And once you understand that, then you can have a little bit more control over it. Right. Um, so enough for the anecdotes. Now let's talk a little bit about Copilot Studio. What I'm going to demonstrate today is how to retrieve information from uh, public websites, from PDF files, and then how to even look at using Power Automate, for example, where it would have a specific action that would return information that you're interested in. And the last one is how to connect it to uh, custom APIs as well. Right. Okay, so we've got about 20 minutes. Um, those are some of the uh, the links. I got those back from when Ignite, uh, they announced Copilot at Ignite. So try Copilot Studio is probably the one that you're interested in, but there are tons of material available out there that can help you get started. All right, so let's have a look at the demo. Just give me a second to speed everything up. So maybe we'll start from scratch. Um, so over the last couple of years, um, I, I was in the uh, I was building a new house, uh, and I already own an, an existing house in Wellington, and then I wanted to um, get it ready so that I can rent it out. So I'm a landlord version in a way. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the uh, you know how, how I need to get started. So the best way to do it is just to go to the public websites, get as much information as you can from, um, you know, the tenancy.gov.nz uh, website, uh, from, uh, you know, all the um, pamphlet information that they provide you in there. They give you checklists on all the things you have to do and, and, and so on. So I thought it would be a good exercise to actually use those to actually create a chatbot that can give you advice on how to become a landlord. Um, so the first thing that I did was I, I just went to Google and I said something like, um, you know, becoming a landlord. So this is a good start. And straight away, it takes us to the website, which is the tenancy.gov.nz website. You click on it and you will notice that it has a bunch of links. So start tenancy, new to tenancy, information for new landlords and so on. Um, so it's it's quite rich in terms of what you can get in there. So as I was saying, there's that expectation nowadays that you, you know, they don't expect you to go and click on every single link and then go and find the information that, that you need. Instead, they should provide you with a chatbot that knows about the content of that website and can surface that all the way in one location. So I go and I ask using natural language, how can I become a landlord? What are the things that I should look into? And then it will give you the answers that you need. So in order to build a chatbot that can do that, um, I'm probably going to go to, let me see if there's something interesting in here. So usually at the end of each page, there's a bunch of PDF files that you can use with additional information. And I think this one in here, which is info pack for new landlords the PDF, is also an interesting one to add. Um, so I did download that uh, file ahead of time. So I'm going to use both the website and I'll go a step above. So uh, beyond that specific page, I'll just take, take that bit off. So I'll start a step above uh, for the um, uh, for new tenancy. And then I'm going to use that PDF to feed into the, uh, uh, the chatbot and get it ready for that. 
So how do we do that? Well, sorry, before I even go there, so I am in the uh, Power, P, Power Virtual Agent .microsoft.com, so PVA. So they haven't renamed the, the URL, um, it's just a legacy name, but this is actually Copilot Studio. And again, um, if you follow any of those links, uh, aka.ms slash Copilot will take you to that uh, specific location. And I'm logged in using my DXC tenancy. And I've got a specific environment, which is my personal environment. And in here, just like creating a new app, you can click on the plus button in the top left corner and then start your journey. So right here, I'm going to create a new chatbot. I'm going to give it a name. It's important to give it a, a useful name because then you can identify in, at a high level what it's doing, uh, but also when it greets you, it will use its name uh, in the greeting. So I'm going to call it GB03. Um, and then straight away, the first thing is asking you is give me a website that I actually go through and understand its content so that I can serve you better. Now, you don't have to put in that URL in here. You can start with a completely blank slate and then build the rest of it yourself. But in my example, I'm just going to add it in here. And then you click on create. And that's it. Okay. Done. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Takes a little bit of time just to figure out what it's doing, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so before I actually get it running, I'm going to feed it the PDF as well. It takes about two, three minutes to ingest the content of that PDF, and then it'll be able to serve you straight away. Um, behind the scenes, what it's actually doing is uh, scrolling through all the information that is available into that uh, public page, going through the, all the different links, trying to navigate through it, and then retrieve useful information. So now it's ready. Um, we can start testing it right now, uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to just add another topic into it so that it actually can uh, uh, serve us better. Uh, so let me have a look. I think uh, details. So you can change the icon in here. You can do a few things. You can go to generative AI. So this is what we're using, generative AI. It already has the one website. You can add more websites if you want to, uh, but I'm going to go and select that info pack for new landlords from my local machine. It is going to load it and then start ingesting it. it. Takes a couple of minutes to actually understand the intent and then it'll be able to give you all the information that you need out of that. So that's done. This will be available in shortly. Um, just for the demo, what I might do is actually, actually let's, let's give it a go. Let's see if it's going to answer me or not. Um, so I'm a new landlord and I want to know what do I need to do for a new tenancy? So that's exactly what I'm going to ask it. What do I need to do for a new tenancy? Some spelling mistakes, that's fine. Hopefully you will understand what I meant. And then it just goes through its knowledge base and tries to understand what information needs to be provided. So as you can see, it actually formatted the response back it actually went through the website, understood what is your intent, what are you asking for, and get you all the information that you need. And all of it is going to have little uh, links in here. So if you can click on that link, then it's going to take you to the tenancy.gov.nz website. Very simple and very targeted, very specific information. And it will have a link at the, at the bottom of it as well. So all of it looks like it's coming from more or less the same page. Um, so again, like I didn't tell it, what it's about. I just give it a title and give it a URL. And then I ask it this question specific about that website and it figured out what I meant and where the information is coming from. Um, so let's start again. And I'll try, I'll try this uh, prompt as well. So now I'm going to ask it something that exists in the PDF file. Um, so what do I need to do before I rent my property? So there's a checklist available in that PDF file um, that goes through all, all the information and you know, tells you what you need to do before you actually start renting your property. Um, so it looks like it, it's, it found another a couple of links, but the PDF has not been ingested yet. So it's not coming back as a, as a PDF option. But let me see if I can go back to a previous uh, copilot that I've built. Then. So that's one that I created yesterday. Let me have a look at what content it has. If I go to generative AI, so it already has the PDF in there and it had lots of time to actually go and understand what it needs to do. Um, 
um, what do I need for I rent my And th this is one thing that I like about those demos is they are unpredictable. So on the one side, it makes sure that I'm on my toes and I'm also always checking that I'm getting the right information and things that are interesting. But also if it doesn't, that's a very good use case to say, you know, with chatbots, it's usually unpredictable. You, you cannot guarantee that you're going to get the same answer every time. And in fact, when we did the New Zealand Business Application Summit, I insisted that at the keynote, they do a session using AI. And then they're like, oh, but it's very unpredictable. Like, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. It might fail. And it failed on the day. And that was beautiful because that's exactly what I wanted them to demonstrate. And they talked about it and it was all good. Uh, so as you can see, this one is, is better trained. Um, so it had all the URL links that we saw in the previous call, but it also had that citation. And that citation is actually coming from the PDF. So if I click on it, it retrieved the information that is available in the PDF and then summarized it in there. Now, the, it's, it's not very well formatted, so that's probably something that they can work on in the future in terms of how to reference that PDF. Uh, but yeah, it, it did grab that older information and provided it to you. And it even shows you in the decision tree um, what is the path that it used to follow it and then to get the, the answer that you actually needed. Okay. Any questions so far? The content changes. Do you... Um... Can you tell it how often it refreshes? I think it's it's part of the feedback loop. Um, so you have to go and, and uh, get it ingested again. I'm not sure if it does it automatically or not, uh, but yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind. Eliza, do you know if it actually automatically refreshes if the content changes, like on a website or something? It would. facing side as a source it just uses it just uses Bing search so if the True. if the info changes it will just grab the latest oh okay yeah yeah so it's saying it live to February query yeah yeah, yeah. well whatever's whatever's been exposed on the website on a public level then it's going to crawl through there yeah which is type it's running it's going to get it live yeah yeah that that, that, that makes sense because when I first started doing that demo, I pointed it to very selfishly to my blog. And I said, like, what's the latest blog post by Rami? And it gave me an older one. I'm like, that's not the latest one. I created one this morning. But yeah, maybe because it didn't call it in time or something. So yeah, it would make sense that it's coming from me. You get better with your prompts. Oh. Yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> yeah. What's the legal implication in regards to scraping data from a website? Legal implications. So as Eliza said, it's it's like a, a search engine, right? Right. So it's capable of actually like if if you open it, you, you can very easily put some extra tags in your website to say don't don't scrape it. Uh, but if it's available to the public, then it's going to do that. Now it becomes interesting when it's secured, yeah. right? So if you have secured sections then it's better to deal with it at the API level and ensure that the security of the person logged in into that uh, chatbot is applied to that API and then they only get the information they're eligible to get. Yeah. Right. So very quickly, what we demonstrated is the capability to ingest data from a public website, but also from a PDF. The next one that we're going to do is to use Power Automate to retrieve information from an instance. So I've got one that is ready that I created earlier, and that Power Automate is very simple. So it has an entry point, which is Power Virtual Agent, and an exit, which is Power Virtual Agent. It doesn't get take any inputs. It's just for simplicity. I was just demonstrating something. But what it will do is that it will actually connect to Dataverse, and then there is a fetch XML query that will say, give me the latest contact ordered by created on the sending. Give me the latest contact and calculate their age and give me their age. So the input is blank because it knows that it's always going to do the same thing. But the response is first name, last name, and an age. Um, so the way I'm going to do it is by enhancing my co-pilot. Uh, so let's say if I go topics and, and plugins, 
And there's two things that we can do. We can either create a plugin action or we can create a uh, copilot plugin. So plugin action I'll talk about in a second, um, and that's with the APIs. But if I want to do a copilot plugin, then I can add a conversational plugin. And I can ask for so, so what you do in here, this is the entry point. So this is the topic that you want to cover. Um, and in order to get it to understand your intent, you just put a few phrases that describe what you want, right? Just uh, variations of what a person might ask, and then it will study that and will try to answer anything that is remotely related to what you're saying in here. So um, who is the latest contact? Um, get me the latest contact uh, from Dataverse. You know, we, we can give it um, um, who did we last add as a customer. Something like that. And then the more you give it, the more variation you give it, the more likely it's going to understand what needs to be done. And I'm going to create a, a new action out of that. So I'm going to call an action and specifically I'm going to call um, co uh, sorry, power, power automate. So again, very simple power automate. All it has is an input, no input whatsoever, just an entry point, and then go and find the latest contact, retrieve some information about that contact and give it back to um, the user. Um, so I've got a couple that I've created in here. Maybe I'll start with this one, which is um, up to date. Right, and as you can see, it has no inputs, but it has three outputs, first name, surname, and the age. And then once I've got this information, then all I'm going to do is just I send the response back and I'm going to say the contact is and then I'm just going to use a variable because now it has that connection back to the power automate. It knows that I can get topic that first name, top, topic that surname and topic dot age. I'm just going to use first name. And um, aged and I'll put the age in here. All right, that's it. All right, so this is leading it a little bit to understand what we're asking, but then using Power Automate to go and do the orchestration behind the scenes to retrieve all the information and bring it back to the customer. So let's see if this is going to work now. It's the latest contact. There's a chance that it will say, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. So I'll go back to an existing one that I've built. It's probably just uh, taking some time to understand it. And what was really interesting is that even uh, when I went back to the one that I've I've used before, um, came a time where none of it worked. Right. So I came back to the existing one that I've built that was working the night before. Asked the same question, didn't work. You know, it's like, oh, did I forget to publish something? Is there something wrong in there? What's happening? And then gave up at like 1 a.m. And then the next morning it was working. I don't know what I did. Maybe I had a good night's sleep. <laughs> Who is the latest? Now it's going to go into that instance. And I'll work on What is the name of the? Um, Try that again one last time. Maybe no, no, it didn't work. Uh, but anyway, it's supposed to go to Dataverse, trigger that power automate, and retrieve the information that you are after. Maybe if we try in an hour, it will work. Okay. All right. So this is power automate. So again, leading it into getting the information that you need. Now, for the last part, and this is the, the most exciting part, in, in my opinion, uh, from that uh, 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 demonstration. There is a sample public API to get information about books. Right? Um, it's unauthenticated. Again, just for simplicity, I'm just taking a very simple example. I didn't build it myself, so that API is provided as an open source API. It gets reset on a daily basis and so on. And just to show you how it works, I've got Postman in here. Um, and you can retrieve books. So it uses a, a normal REST API. So you can say something like get books where the jar is documentary and search for value, for example. 
So if I click on send in here, it's doing going to do a, a get post. Hopefully it will return with nothing. Yes, because every night it gets reset. So now we've got a fresh instance where we go and ask for documentary books written by Rami or documentary books, and it returns nothing. There's another API that allows us to actually go and populate data into that API. So I'm going to say that I wrote a book called D365 Extension, second edition in 2024. Um, so let me click on send. So this is going to go and create that specific book. And I'm going to say the first edition that I published of that book when did I publish my book? Was 2018. Thank you very much. Right. So now I've got two books that I've added into that API. So now if I go back to get books and click on send, then it's going to return those two books that I've got in JSON format. Everybody loves JSON, really easy to use. Again, public API available there. There's one thing that that API can also do is to go and uh, fil filter the information. Um, but also to update that book. So I can go and say, show me the books. Um, so just get books. It returned those two books and each book has an ID. So I can pick that ID in here and I can go put it into that patch. So this is the ID that I want to do. And then in the body, I'm telling it to go and update it as a book that has been checked out. So if I click on send, checkout equals true. Let's put it to true. And then click on send. And of your uncle. So now this message is OK. So now if I click on get me all the books again, it's going to say that that first book has been checked out, whereas that book is not checked out. Right? Very simple API create books, retrieve books, update books. Right? So behind the scenes, what I did was I used those custom APIs to create custom connectors. So in Power Platform, um, you have an area where you can create custom connectors. So I created the 1101 connector now in the in the system, and that includes all those different capabilities that you can do with that with that API. So now my tenancy understands how to connect to that book API and how to store information and also retrieve information. So the next step that I'm going to do in my demo is that copilot get copilot to start using that API. Right. So which one are we in? Look, I'll go back to the. Three one. Some topics and create, and in here I'm going to create a plugin action. Right, so right away it gives me the option to go and uh, connect to all the APIs that are available within my uh, my instance. So get books is something that I've created. So search for that. Hopefully it will appear in there again for simplicity. I'm not using any uh, specific authentication capability or anything like that. Um, so yeah, th those are the icons that I selected. So get books. Actually, we'll try and read what the, the connector is doing. And it's going to get, tell me everything is OK, and then I can just finish that. That's it. Next, so ingested this information. It looked at all the information that is available in there, and I can click on, on, on finish. Now, before I do that, I've done a little bit of work to avoid doing extra work at that stage. So typically, it would tell you, oh, I've identified that there is an attribute called documentary. Uh, what does that mean? And you need to give it some data, some information description, so that it can understand what it's for and what it can be used for. But instead of doing it at this stage, I did that in the custom connectors. When I created the custom connector, every single attribute that is an input or an output, I added description to it. And by doing that, then when you ingest it, it goes through those descriptions and understand the intent. So document your API as well using natural language, and then it will understand that intent and it will allow you to use it straight away. All right, so this is get books. Um, so now it will know how to get the books. The second thing that I need to do is to update a book. Maybe get a book, update a book. Let's have a look. Um, so I'll, I'm going to do the same to update the book. Save books. Let's see what it will return. Book checkout, I think I called it. So let's make sure I use the same custom API that I've created. Get book. Checkout book. 
Is it the third one? Um, I, I just want to make sure I use the same connector. So check out both. So I've used, I've created two custom ones with different right. icons. I uh, just want to make sure it's the same one. So again, this is going to require an ID for that book. And in the description, I said, this is the ID that will be used to update that book. So now it understands what it is. And then maybe one last one is to get one book. So rather than get all books, get one book. Darkness. Check out book, create book, delete book, get book. Darkness. And that will require an ID so that it can give you details about one specific. All right. Now, before I start testing it, there's one thing that I have to do is dynamic linking, which is allowing it to understand. So if I go to the plugin actions, you will notice that I've got three plugin actions, get books, get book, and then check out book. So that's all good, but they're not linked. So if I'm in a conversation, I want to make sure that those topics are linked with each other. I need to enable dynamic linking. Um, so the way I do it is I go generative AI on the settings. I scroll down in here, and there's a little toggle that says dynamic chaining with generative actions. So if I click on that, then it enables that capability. So now if I go back to uh, don't leave, save, to get to save. Then if I go back to the overview or to the topic specifically, and I go to the actions, all of them are going to be to have dynamic chaining enabled in there. And this is still in preview mode. All right, so hopefully that's that's enough. So again, all I did was just pointed to an API and I didn't do anything other than that. So let's start with a prompt. This is the moment of truth. Let's see if this is going to work. So I'll say get books. So if it worked, discussing me for the genre because the genre is uh, a required field, and this is how it's going to filter the content uh, that is required. So just think about it for a second. An API, something that is just like, you know, instructions. Um, that goes into and retrieves information. All I did was just point it to an API, and it's understood that if I ever ask for a book, I'll be calling that specific API, and that API requires a genre, and it automatically asks me, what, how do you want to filter it? What's the genre that you want in there? So if I say documentary, and then now it passes this information and sends it out, and retrieves the two books that we created and says that one is checked out and the one other one is not checked out. Um, let me see if I can do get books with ID. So hopefully it will be able to understand that and will give me the IDs as well. I didn't get that. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I'll just go get it from uh, the rest API. Right. So now it did it again. The formatting is not excellent, but it actually got the IDs respectively of the first book and the second book. So I'm going to get that specific ID in here. And I'm going to ask it to check that book out. So maybe what I'll do, I'll start by doing a copy at the moment. Start with a copy. Say check out book. Now, it might understand that I want to check out the first book or all books. Um, if it's smart enough, it might actually tell me to um, fasten the book has first checked out. So it probably just took the existing ones because they are chained um, and it knew exactly what uh, how to do it. Uh, but I can say check out book and I can pass it an ID. I don't know if it'll understand that. Again, sometimes it does understand the intent that you need to pass it an ID. So you would say check out book and will say which ID. And sometimes it wouldn't understand. Okay, so now it's understood that this book with this specific identifier has been successfully checked out, right? And again, like I, I didn't tell it there's an ID and this is how you need to do it. It just did it by itself. Um, so just to show you that I'm not lying, I'm going to go back to um, <laughs> Postman and then see that send over there. <laughs> and then hopefully both of them will be checked out. Yeah, both of them checked out. And then I tried, can you check the book in? 
but I was like, was checking in. So I had to change it to, can you set the checkout to false? And then it's like, ah, oh, yeah, now I understand what you're saying. So again, refinement, right? So you get that feedback loop, you understand what people are doing, and then ingest that data, see if that was correct or not, and, and then move on. Now, also built in into uh, Copilot Studio is the notice that you're not getting anywhere. Um, so I think after three tries, if it doesn't know what you're doing, it will automatically say, hey, do you want me to escalate to an agent? And in that case, it will get you in contact with someone on the phone to, to go and give you the support that you need. Cool. So yeah, that's that's everything that I wanted to demonstrate. I think it went better than expected. I was a bit stressed that it might be a bit random, but in the context of things, uh, like the, the the failures were actually a good learning exercise to see that you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and um, it's doing the right thing. Um, so I'm open for questions now. Uh, no questions on licensing. <laughs> <laughs> Any example you say? Um, it doesn't understand what does check in mean, and then and then you explain that this checkout equals false. Right? Then the next time you say, "Can I check in?" Within well, the next time, will it have learned that check in equals check out equals false? Yeah, I've, I've tried that, like you know, by forcing the intent over and over and over again. Yeah. It doesn't always uh, do that. Um, in that case, so because you're so so. You know, there's all this app insight and, and telemetry that you're capturing. Um, it's always recommended to monitor that and have a look at all the chats and what's been asked and, and how it's behaving, and then go and build that capability within your chatbot and then get it to, to actually do that intent. It's like, you know, do it a bit more constructive. More yeah, 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 exactly. Um, like, you know, everything that I did was literally like, you know, just 30 seconds, just feeding it information and then getting it to do the rest of it, which is the power of Copilot. And as Charles Lamana said, it's just the beginning, right? So if you can do all of that today, imagine with all those questions that you guys are asking in the community, like, oh, why doesn't it do that? Or can it be a bit smarter in that space? This is all learning and feedback that will make the, the platform better over time. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see how far we can go with those capabilities. And the main thing is how quickly we can build things like that. Um, I've got an addiction on YouTube. I watch a lot of short videos, um, like the whole time I can, like, you know, it can be 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm just watching those like 30 second videos. Um, and um, there's a, a, a musician that actually says, oh, I'm going to show you how to play this musician in 30 seconds. And he would pick a musician and he would, Play something exactly in their genre. You would think that that's done by that you know, famous artist, but actually it's just his interpretation. So I thought, why don't I, don't I do a series on how to co-pilot in 30 seconds? You know, and and you will be able to do it in 30 seconds, right? So how can you like you know build generative AI and understand website content in 30 seconds? It took me 30 seconds to do that. How to build the power pages? You know, site like Mark did this morning in 30 seconds. You can do that, right? I mean, with a bit of editing, but at the end of the day, you just have one input, tell it your intent, and then it does all of it for you. So, yeah, I think there's lots of potential in that space. Yeah. Just thinking about that, um, Air Canada, and um, is there anything we could do to stop it from answering, like partially? So it, it wasn't wrong. As long as they in the condition, if if you meant condition this or that, yeah, I think in that case it all has to do with the completeness of the information that is available on the page, um, because like uh, it's it's like. Um, you know, and, and my farm and trying to think like a mouse and understand like what would a mouse do and how would I catch a mouse and um, think about what the uh, the chatbot is going to do, like how, what it's going to look for, what it's going to understand as complete information and what it's going to give back to the customer. So the FAQ are usually done in a way so that there is a flow to them. Right, so you may get to one page and then get to another page where that partial answer is. Whereas chatbot can use them individually without co collecting them together. So it's all about making sure that there's enough information in one place to give you the, the the right information. And I would recommend like thorough testing just to make sure that it's actually giving the right the right answers in there. Yeah, Eliza, do you have any tips on that to the next session? Yeah. 
you mentioned earlier, just using Azure AI Language Studio, the conversational language understanding capability, as well as combining it with the custom Q&A for having a specific knowledge base that has, you know, where you pretty much just copy paste what's in your policy ready document that's been approved already internally, or if you want a more formal response, and that's when you would use it. Because when you, when you, um, yeah, as I mentioned, when you use your conversational language understanding model, you have to define the topic and the um, phrase, phrases that it maps to in Copilot Studio. And then with your custom Q&A, you call that as a, um, a plugin action, or you can do further customization using the cloud flow. Yeah, I'll try to do a session on it in the, in the future. I was talking to Ravi in between the sessions saying, oh, maybe I should do it because it seems like not many people know about it. Yeah. yeah. The example is um, I was doing the tenancy services, like you said, and um, so there was this um, rule around doing property inspection and you need to inform the tenant within 48 hours. Um, so I was asking the chatbot of how much notice do they need? And they said 48 hours, which is correct, but it cannot be more than 14 days. I, it, it, it was in the same sentence, but it kind of omitted that part of it. And it's true, it's yeah. 48 hours. Yeah. And where I phrased the question, or oh, how much notice do they need? I mean, 48 hours, it's usually what you need to know, but you also wouldn't want to be breaking the rules by giving notice 16 days before. Yeah, so, yeah, so this, is, this is an example where it tries to be too smart by concising the, the answer. I think there's even a setting in there that you can say give um, shorter answers or longer answers with more information. So you can tune it as well to do that. That reminds me of like back in the Windows Phone days. Um, that's like oh, how long ago it was like probably 10 years or more. And then I had a coffee catch up with someone and then my phone started telling me that you need to leave now because there's traffic until you get home. It's like you're you know, your, your, your meeting is in 15 minutes and it will take you 30, 30 minutes to get home. I'm like, what, what the hell is it talking about? And then I realized that the coffee that I'm coffee shop that I'm going to is called Home Cafe. And folks <laughs> like, you know, I'm going home and then it tried to be smart and give me advice. And I'm like, Just jump. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a very good example where things get mixed up um, or it gives you a partial answer. But yeah, it's good feedback. Um, let me see if I can actually highlight where that setting is. Um, can you automate the testing, like as much of it as possible, or for another? Um, yeah, that that, that, that should be possible. Yeah, yeah, it should be possible because um, actually one of the things um, we're, we're running out of time, but one of the things that I didn't uh, demonstrate is how to publish it, right? Um, so even like without going that, if I go to channels, um, okay, so security is enabled. So it's stopping me from putting it into a public domain. But if I go and, and change the settings, uh, security in here, and I talk about um, authentication, yeah, no authentication, and I click on save here, and I go to that, go to the channel, and then create a demo website. And I copy that, and then I go to another tab, and I paste that. And now it's going to have a, a public website where you can actually go and do it. Um, so very likely this would be using standard HTML, so you can you do your testing in there. I'm not sure if it will have like some, um, yeah, I did that yesterday. Um, it will have like some public APIs that you can use so that you can do more like backend testing rather than front end testing. But that's that's a good idea. Um, there's like so many things that we can talk about. Um, this like the capability of using custom cards uh, where you can have a nice design to the answers that are returned. Actionable cards as well. We can have buttons and so on. So there's like so many things that you can do. Uh, but yeah, we're just scratching the surface. Um, so regarding the answers, let me see if I can easily. Uh, find where that was. I maybe, yeah. So copilot content moderation. Uh, fewer answers, but responses are more relevant. 
uh, all the way to low, which is um, Copilot generates the most answers, but responses can be inaccurate. So you can do the, the bit of fine tuning in, in that space in here just to make sure you get the right piece. So it's that long. Yeah. I had that on high. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. So it's probably just uh, making sure you've got the right information in there. But anyway, that's good feedback. Um, so it's something that uh, it can be fed back into the product team. All right, any other questions? Just really quick, a um, bit more technical. Obviously, that was getting success responses from the APIs on the custom connector. Have you seen how it handles, say, if it was to get an error response or potentially a response, say, you tried to check out a book that was already checked out and you'd configured it to return and say it can't be done? Does yeah, um, so I haven't gone that far into, into the demo, but that's definitely something that needs to be handled. Um, a very good example that I was getting, and, and this is just by doing the vanilla stuff. Um, so my Power Automate uh, goes in, into Dataverse and gets the last person that was entered, retrieves their date of birth, and calculates an age based on the, the date of birth and today's date. right? But I didn't do it so that you can actually handle the fact that you don't have a date of birth. So what it was then doing is returning a 404 or, or a server error, and then it was displaying that to the customer. I miss it. And I'm like, that's that's not right. So it needs to handle it. So you need to handle those situations. Think about if you have an error, how you would deal with it. All right, I think that's me. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the day, but we've got Eliza joining us next and also talking about Copilot Studio and her tips on how to do that.